Welcome back, AP. This is chapter 20, um, the beginning of the Civil War. Civil War took place from 1861 to 1865. We are continuing focusing on Key Concept 5.3. Some of the key terms from chapter 20, in addition to the key people. Abraham Lincoln solemnly took the presidential oath of office on March 4th, 1861. And because his election um, was causing so much animosity between the North and the South, he had to slip into Washington, D.C. at night, partially disguised in order to um, thwart assassination attempts. He thus became president not to the United States of America, but of the disunited States of America. Following uh, South Carolina, six states had already seceded from the nation, and there were still more teetering on whether or not they should secede along with those seven. The girders of the unfinished Capitol Dome loomed nakedly in the background as if to symbolize the imperfect state of the Union. Before the nation was restored and the slaves freed at last, the American people would end endure four years of anguish and bloodshed. President Lincoln would face torturous trials of leadership, such has, such have been visited upon few presidents. The menace of secession. President Abraham Lincoln declared that secession was impractical because the North and the South were not geographically divided, meaning there was no barrier that could really separate the North and the South, for example, mountains or rivers. In addition, was that there was the national debt that the southern states had helped the country um, rack up. So Lincoln was arguing with them seceding from the nation, who now is left with the responsibility of the national debt. New controversies also included the federal territories and the fugitive slave issues. <clears throat> South Carolina assails Fort Sumter. When President Lincoln was elected, there were only two significant forts in the South that flew the Union flag. Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor needed supplies in order to support its men. Therefore, Lincoln adopted a middle-of-the-road solution. He told the South that the North was sending provisions to the fort, not to supply reinforcements. Taking the move by Lincoln as an act of aggression, the South Carolina Carolinans fired upon Fort Sumter on April 12, 1861. Following that, Virginia, Arkansas, and Tennessee all seceded from the nation. Lincoln now had a reason for an armed response, and he called upon the Union states to supply militiamen. Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and West Virginia are all considered border states. They were the only slave states that hadn't seceded from the Union. The border states contained the Ohio River, which was a vital necessity for bo both the North and the South. The official statement that Lincoln made for war was to fight to preserve the Union, not to end slavery. The five civilized tribes of Native, Native Americans, which included the Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole, they all sided with the Confederacy. These tribes were allowed to send delegates to the Confederacy Congress. And then on the other side, most of the Plains Indians sided with the Union. Some of the advantages at the beginning of the war for both the North and the South, we'll look at the South first. Some of the advantages of the South included um, fighting a defensive war on its own land and it did not have to win in order to preserve the Confederacy. It just had to fight to a draw. Abraham Lincoln had offered Robert E. Lee command of the Northern Army, Army, but Lee turned the job down, deciding to fight for his home state of Virginia. And there was also the fact that Southerners seemed to be uh, well-trained to fight um, because they had learned to ride and shoot from an early age. Some of the northern advantages included uh, 
one, the economic advantage. The North had a lot of resources that the South did not have, and three-fourths of the nation's wealth resided in the northern states. Also, the North had three-quarters of the railroads, um, so the transportation is better in the North. The South was at a disadvantage because they relied so heavily on um, specific crops that they never really jumped on board with the factory system, which will eventually lead to a shortage of supplies for the Confederacy. Another Northern advantage was their population. They just had more people. The North outnumbered the South by a margin of 22 million to, to 9 million, um, of which 3.5 million were slaves. And during the Civil War, immigration continued into the Union. Approximately 800,000 European immigrants arrived in the, the North at this time. King Cotton fails to secure foreign aid. The South counted on foreign intervention to win the war. The common people of Britain supported the North, hoping to extinguish slavery. Britain restrained its own and French ironclads from breaking the Union blockade. The British manufacturers depended upon cotton from the South, but before the war, from 1857 to 1860, a surplus of cotton had developed in Britain, allowing it to function without having to purchase cotton from the South. In 1861, the cotton supply ran out, and many British factory workers were laid off as a result of that. As Union armies penetrated the South, they sent cotton to Britain. King wheat and king corn, which were produ produced great quantities in the North, proved to be more powerful than king cotton. Therefore, Britain wasn't able to break the blockade to gain cotton, because if it had, it would lose um, commodities that they thought were more important, which were wheat and corn. Foreign crisis during the Civil War. The Trent Affair occurred in 1861. A Union warship stopped a British mail steamer, the Trent, and removed two Confederate diplomats who were heading to Europe. Britain started to send troops into um, Canada in order to be prepared for any Union backlash. President Lincoln freed the Confederate prisoners and the British shipyards were unknowingly producing Confederate commerce raiders. The British uh, ships left their ports unarmed. They ended up picking up weapons or arms elsewhere, and then they were used to capture Union ships. And one of the notable um, commerce raiders of the Confederacy was the Alabama. In 1863, two Confederate warships were being constructed in the British shipyard of John Laird and Sons. Their large iron rams would have destroyed the Union blockade. To avoid infuriating the North, the London government bought the ships from the Royal Navy. The British established the Dominion of Canada in 1867. It was partly designed to strengthen the Canadians against the possible vengeance of the United States. Emperor Napoleon III of France dispatched a French army to occupy Mexico City in 1863. He installed Maximilian as Emperor of Mex Mexico City. The actions of Napoleon were in direct violation of the Monroe Doctrine. Napoleon was counting on the Union not retaliating due to its weakness. When the Civil War ended in 1865, Napoleon was forced to abandon Maximilian and Mexico City. Lincoln versus Davis. The one defect of the South was that its own states could secede. Some state troops refused to serve outside of their border. President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy often had disputes with his own Congress. Davis was tasked as president, and it proved to be beyond his power. Lincoln and the North enjoyed a long-established government that was financially stable and fully recognized 
both at home and abroad by the foreign countries. Some limitations on wartime liberties. Due to the fact that Congress was not in session when war broke out, President Lincoln proclaimed a blockade. He increased the size of the Federal Army. He directed the Secretary of Treasury to advance $2 million without appropriation or security to three private citizens for military purposes. And he suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which states that a citizen could not be held without due process of trial. All of these things were uh, required to be approved by Congress, and Lincoln did it without that approval. Due to lack of volunteers, Congress passed in 1863 a federal draft law. Men who were called in the draft could pay $300 in order to buy a replacement. The Confederacy also passed a draft law. The economics of the war. The North increased tariffs and excise taxes to financially support the war. It also created the first income tax. In 1861, after enough prote anti-protection Southern members had seceded, Congress passed the Moral Tariff Act. It was a high protective tariff that increased duties 5 to 10 percent. The increases were designed to raise additional revenue and provide more protection for the prosperous manufacturers. A protective tariff became identified with the Republican Party. The Washington Treasury <clears throat> issued greenbacked paper money. The greenbacks were backed by the nation's fluctuating gold supply, hence the value of the greenback was constantly changing. In 1863, Congress authorized the national banking system. It was designed to stimulate the sale of government bonds and to establish a standard banknote currency. Banks who joined the national banking system could buy government bonds and issue sound paper money backed by the bonds. The, go the Confederate government was forced to print blue-backed paper money that was subject to runaway inflation. You can see that the Confederate economy by the end of the war um, was much more damaged than the North because during the war, the North continued to prosper economically. Newly invented labor-saving machinery enabled the North to expand economically. Mechanical reapers, which are farm machines used to harvest grain, allowed for men to leave the farms for the war and provided grain that contributed to the Northern profits. The discovery of petroleum in Pennsylvania in 1859 led to a rush of people uh, known as the 59ers, the Civil War opened up many jobs for women that were originally occupied by men. And the crushed economy of the South, the North's blockade severely hampered the South's economy. Transportation in the South collapsed during the Civil War. Cotton capitalism had lost out to industrial capitalism.